Introduction to the Hindi Edition Srimad Bhagavad Gita is composed by Sri Srimad Krishna Dvaipayana Vedavyasa, the universal teacher and an incarnation of Bhagavan. It constitutes 18 chapters of Bhishma Parva, chapters 25 to 24 of his vast epic, Sri Mahabharata. Swayam Bhagavan Sri Krishna has given very valuable and fundamental instructions to his eternal associate and dear friend Arjuna for the benefit of all human beings to help them cross the ocean of material existence and attain his lotus feet. To enable deluded conditioned souls like us to pass beyond the delusion of the external material energy, Maya, he made his eternal associate Arjuna become as if enchanted by Maya, so that he would ask questions that correspond to the various eligibilities of the deluded living entities. Sri Krishna then answered those questions himself, thereby dispelling all kinds of doubts and defining the means by which the living entities can be systematically freed from the delusion of Maya. Srimad Bhagavad Gita is also known as Gita Upanishad. It is the essence of all Vedic knowledge and the most significant Upanishad in Vedic literature. Those who constantly study this book with faith under the shelter of the spiritual master, saintly persons and Vaishnavas will be able to ascertain its true import easily. As a result, they will transcend the ocean of material existence and attain transcendental devotion to the lotus feet of Sri Krishna. In this way, they will become eligible to attain pure love for him. Of this, there is not the slightest doubt. Nowadays, it is observed that the great thinkers and Venerated gentlemen of India revere Srimad Bhagavad Gita. Members of all the siblic lineages, Sampradayas, also show great honor and faith in the Gita. Even many celebrated politicians have shown faith in this monarch of books and philosophers from all countries of the world, have lauded it profusely. Since ancient times, many commentaries have been written on Srimad Bhagavad Gita. Famous among them are the commentaries of prominent monists, Advaita Vadis, such as Sri Shankara Acharya, Srimad Anandagiri, and Sri Madhusudan Saraswati. Most people study and lecture from these commentaries alone. Some people conclude their study of the Gita with the following commentaries. The principle of specialized monism by Vishisht Advaitavadi, Sri Ramanuj Acharya. The principle of purified monism by Shud Advaita Vadi Sridhara Swami, or the principle of pure dualism by Shuddha Dvaita Acharya, Sriman Madhava Acharya. Furthermore, at present, some people also conclude their study with the interpretations of political personalities like Lokamanya Tilaka. Gandhiji and Sri Aravinda. Most people, however, do not receive the good fortune to deeply study the commentary 
of the proponents of the devotional school of Vedanta, established by Sri Gauranga Mahaprabhu, Sri Gaudiya Vedanta Acharya, Sri Baladeva Vidyabhushana, who is proficient in Ajintya Beda Abeda Siddhanta, the principle of inconceivable difference and non difference nor the commentary of Sri Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, the crest jewel of Gaudiya Vaishnava preceptors. The seventh Goswami of the Sri Gaudiya Vaishnava Sampradaya and the best among the followers of Sri Rupa Goswami, Srila Bhaktinoth Thakur, published in Bengali two editions of the Gita, with two different elucidations on its translations, which are based on the import of Sri Vishwanaj Chakravarti Thakur's and Sri Baladeva Vidyabhushana's commentaries. His explanations are fundamental and full of beautiful conclusions that follow the Rupanuga conception and that are conductive to Shuddha Bhakti. The transcendental benefit bestowed upon mankind by these two great editions is indescribable. Through his elucidations, Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur establishes the eternality, universality and supremacy of Bhakti, thereby bestowing the greatest benefit upon those journeying to the kingdom of Shuddha Bhakti. At present, various inauthentic persons are publishing speculative commentaries on the Gita, in which they shamelessly present their imaginary, inconclusive theories about the synthesis of spirit and matter, Chit Jada Samanvayavada. They also try to prove that pure devotion, which is eternal, is worthless. In most of these commentaries, either prescribed duty or empiric knowledge in the form of impersonal Mayavadism is expounded as the sole import of the Gita. By reading and hearing such commentaries, people of delicate fate are being deviated from the path. The Nigama Shastras, Vedas, are very extensive. Some portions of them contain instructions on mundane religiosity, Dharma, others on prescribed duty, Karma others on analytical knowledge, Sankhya, Jnana, and yet others on Bhagavad, Bhakti, loving devotion to Bhagavan, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. What is the mutual relationship between these systems? And when is it one's duty to relinquish one to engage in another? Although, a description of such credited eligibilities is also found in those very scriptures. It is very difficult for living entities born in the age of Kali, whose lives are but short and whose intellects are meager, to completely study those vast scriptures and ascertain their own qualification. For this reason, a concise, straightforward and scientific investigation is indispensable. At the end of Drapara Yuga, most people became incapable of understanding the true import of the Vedic scriptures and thus began to propagate their own theories. Some declare karma or fruitive action to be the sole intention of the Vedas, while others declared material enjoyment, analytical knowledge, logic or monism to be its sole intent. 
In this way, the divergent opinions that arose from their incomplete knowledge began to create affliction in India, just as unchewed foodstuffs causes discomfort and pain to the stomach. At that time, the supremely compassionate Bhagavan, Sri Krishna Chandra, gave the instructions of Srimad Bhagavad Gita to his dear associate and friend Arjuna for the benefit of the living entities of the world. Srimad Bhagavad Gita, which is an investigation on the essential import of all the Vedas, is therefore the crest jewel of all Upanishads. It describes the mutual relationship between the processes of Karma Yoga, Yan Yoga and so on, and expounds pure Hari Bhakti as the supreme goal of the living entities. Karma Yoga, the path of spiritual advancement, where the fruit of one's pious action is offered to the Lord. Jnana Yoga, the path of spiritual advancement through transcendental knowledge, and Bhakti Yoga, the path of loving devotion to the Supreme Lord, are not actually different systems. They are simply the first, second and third steps of the one yoga process. The first stage of that complete yoga is called karma yoga, the second Yan yoga and the third bhakti yoga. The Upanishads, Brahma Sutra and Srimad Bhagavad Gita are completely devotional literatures. They elaborately describe karma, jnana, mukti and the attainment of Brahman, but then comparatively deliberate on them and ultimately establish Shuddha Bhakti as supreme. Readers of the Gita can be divided in two categories, those possessed of a gross or superficial understanding, stula darshis, and those possessed of fine discrimination, shukshma darshis. The first type makes conclusions based exclusively on the external meaning of the Gita's statements. The second type, however, is not satisfied with only the external meanings and inquires into the deep, fundamental purport. The external Stula Darshis reads the Gita from beginning to end and concludes that it establishes karma, because after hearing the entire Gita, Arjuna understands that to fight is beneficial. The Shukshma Darshis, however, are not satisfied with such a shallow conclusion. They determine either knowledge of the impersonal aspect of the Lord, Brahma Jnana, or transcendental devotion, Para Bhakti, to be the aim of the Gita, and say that Arjuna's engaging in battle is simply an example of adhering to one's own level of eligibility. But this is not the highest essence of the Gita. A man's nature determines his qualification to engage in work, prescribed duty. As he maintains his life accordingly, he gradually obtains knowledge of the truth. Unless he performs some work, he will have difficulty maintaining himself, and without maintaining himself, it will be difficult for him to ponder the truth. Therefore, in the primary stage, it is necessary to properly execute one's prescribed duty that is in accordance with one's varna, caste, and station in life. It is important to know here that of all virtuous action, karma, 
the Gita only accepts selflessly performed action that is offered to Bhagavan. Such karma gradually purifies the heart and bestows knowledge of the truth. Then, through the performance of devotion or bhakti, Bhagavan is finally attained. In order to understand Srimad Bhagavad Gita's purport and ultimate subject, one must follow the instructions of the person who spoke it. Swayam Bhagavan Sri Krishna. He is referred to as Bhagavan, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, on every page. Out of his causeless mercy throughout the Gita, Sri Krishna declares himself to be Bhagavan, the Supreme Absolute Truth. Gita 10.8 I am the source of both mundane and spiritual worlds. Everything emanates from me. The wise who know this well engage in bhajan of me with ecstasy in their hearts. Gita 7.7 .7. O conqueror of riches, Dhanan Jaya, there is nothing superior to me. This whole creation is dependent on me, just as jewels are strung on a thread. Gita 9.24 I am the only master and enjoyer of all sacrifices. But those who do not recognize my transcendental body fall down and repeatedly wander in the cycle of birth and death. Many other scriptures also state Sri Krishna to be Swayam Bhagavan. Ete Kamsha Kalaha Pumshaha Krishnas to Bhagavan Swayam. Srimad Bhagavatam 1.3.28 All avatars, beginning with Rama and Nrisimha, are the parts and parts of the parts of the Supreme Person, Bhagavan. However, only Krishna is the original Swayam, Bhagavan. Ishvara Parama Krishna Satchit Ananda Vigraha Brahma Samhita 5.1 The Supreme Lord, Ishvara, is Krishna. His form is eternal, all-knowing and blissful. Srimad Bhagavatam 10.14.32 How greatly fortunate are Nanda Maharaj, the cowherd man, and all the other inhabitants of Rajabhumi. There is no limit to their good fortune. Because the absolute truth, the source of transcendental bliss, the eternal supreme Brahman, has become their friend. It is important to know in this regard that of Bhagavan's various incarnations none have revealed their godliness or Bhagavata. In the Gita, however, Bhagavan Sri Krishna clearly makes known his position as the Supreme Lord and defines surrender and bhakti to him as the supreme spiritual practice, sadhana for all living entities. Through the principle of Tri Satya, or an oath thrice affirmed, Sri Krishna establishes his own godliness and defines devotion to him as the topmost spiritual practice, sadhana, and goal, sadhya. He does this with the words Mam Eva to me in the verse Mam Eva Ye Prapatyante Surrender only to me Gita 7.24 With the words Mam Eva to me in the verse Te Pimam Eva Konteya They worship only me 
Gita 9.23 and with the words Mam e kam to me alone in the verse Mam e kam shadanam braja surrender exclusively to me Gita 1866 Moreover, not only Sri Krishna but even the great sages and perfected souls such as Deva Rishi Narada Asita, Devala and Vyasa confirm this truth and Arjuna too accepts it from the very beginning. Therefore, anyone who reads or listens to the Gita will approach the supreme truth in a mood of acceptance, free from the slightest doubt that the speaker of the Gita, Sri Krishna, is the original Supreme Personality of Godhead. Each and every one of his teachings are completely true. Sri Krishna has told Arjuna in the verse Bhaktu Sime Sakajeti Rahasyam Hi Etat Utamam Gita 4.1 to 3 This Gita is eternal. At first, Billions of years ago, I gave these instructions to the sun god, Vivasvan. Vivasvan gave them to Manu, and Manu gave them to Ikshvaku. This system of yoga thus remained in the world through the disciplic succession, Guru Parampara. But that Parampara disappeared with the passing of time. You are my exclusive devotee, my dear friend and my direct disciple. I am therefore bestowing this supreme secret upon you. It is impossible to comprehend the profound truths of the Gita without being a devotee. For throughout this scripture it is declared that its import cannot be grasped without bhakti. Bhaktya ananyaya shakya aham evam vidho arjuna. It is only through exclusive devotion that my form can actually be seen. Gita 11.54 The Gita has been spoken only for the devotees of Bhagavan. This is what is meant by the statement idam te na tapaskaya na bhaktyaya kada jana. You should never explain this Bhagavad Gita to anyone whose senses are uncontrolled, who is a non-devotee, who is devoid of a serving mood and who is envious of me. Gita 18.67 the Gita describes three kinds of sadhakas or practitioners of a particular discipline. They are the jnani, the yogi and the bhakta. In the Gita, the words jnani and yogi do not refer to impersonalist mayavadis who maintain that the absolute truth is unmanifest, featureless, formless and devoid of potency. Rather, they refer to jnanis and yogis who are endowed with bhakti. In the Gita 7.19, Sri Krishna clearly says Bahunam jnanmanam ante jnavan mam prapatyate the true jnani is one who is surrendered unto me and who has pure devotion for me. Such a great soul is very rare. His definition of a yogi in Gita 6.47 is similarly clear. Yoginam apisarvisham mat gati nantaratmanam. He who constantly worships me with full faith 
always thinking exclusively of me within is, in my opinion, the topmost of all yogis. Therefore, a person who is devoid of bhakti is never eligible to hear the Gita. If he is not eligible even to hear it, how can he understand its import? It is necessary to surrender to Sri Krishna's lotus feet with the knowledge that he is Swayam Bhagavan and to hear the truths of the Gita from the mouth of a great devotee in a true Guru Parampara who has seen the truth. Unless a person does this, he will not be able to understand the Gita's import. According to Srimad Bhagavad Gita, Sri Krishna, who possesses all majesty and sweetness, Aishwarya and Madhurya, is the supreme object of worship of the living entities, and Bhakti, which attracts Sri Krishna, is the supreme process and goal. Nevertheless, because ignorant people consider this crow's body as I and objects related to it as mine, they remain cheated of their true constitutional nature. They are therefore incapable of correctly understanding the essential truths of bhakti. Because of their gross intelligence, they consider mundane fruitive activity, karma, the only reality. And because of their ignorance, they remain engrossed in it. They consequently fall into the clutches of monism or mayavad. Sri Krishna inspired Arjuna to raise the topics of these types of mundane religiosity. He then established both their insignificance and the supreme eminence of bhakti. Of the 18 chapters of the Gita, the first six establish the unique features of karma yoga, the last six the main features of Yan yoga and the middle six the prominent features of bhakti yoga. Thus, bhakti remains situated in the center and gives shelter to karma and jnana. This is because karma and jnana are incapable of bestowing any result without the assistance of bhakti devi. Karma Bhagavan Sri Krishna personally instructs Arjuna about the necessity of performing one's prescribed duty, karma, for the pleasure of Bhagavan. One's not doing so becomes the cause of bondage, as stated in Gita 3.9. O son of Kunti, all actions other than the selfless performance of one's prescribed duty offered to Sri Vishnu are a cause of bondage to this world. Therefore, become free from all desires for the fruits of your actions and perform appropriate action solely for his satisfaction. The word Yagyatart in this verse means offered to Sri Vishnu. Therefore, prescribed duties should be performed solely for the pleasure of Vishnu, because Sri Krishna says in Gita 5.29, Bhaktaram Yagya Tabasam. He who knows me to be the enjoyer of all sacrifices and austerities, the supreme controller of all planets, and the well-wisher of all living entities, attains liberation. He also says in Gita 3.30, My Sarvani Karmani Sanyasya. All prescribed duties should be performed as an offering to me. Furthermore, in Gita 9.27, he says, Whatever you do, do it for my pleasure. Offer it to me. 
We thus see that Sri Krishna instructs living entities who are eligible to perform their prescribed duty to only perform Nishkama Bhagavat Arpita Karma, selfless work offered to the Supreme Lord. He does not give them the instruction to merely perform the prescribed duty. Karma usually only refers to prescribed duty that is accompanied by devotion or bhakti. Karma, in which bhakti predominates over karma, is known as karma mishra bhakti or bradani bhuta bhakti only when the performance of one's prescribed duty is solely for the pleasure of Bhagavan, can it truly be termed karma, as stated in the verse, Tat Karma Hari Toshanam Yat, Srimad Bhagavatam 4.29.49. For this reason, in Gita 11.55, Bhagavan also states, Only he who performs karma for my pleasure attains me. Jnana Sri Krishna states that among the four kinds of people who are surrendered to him, namely the distressed, Artha, the inquisitive, Jigyasu, the seekers of wealth, Artartis, and those in search of knowledge, Jnanis, the Jnanis are the best. What is the nature of the Jnanis? Gita 7.17 states Tejam jnani nitya yukta eka bhaktir vishishyate Those jnanis possess exclusive devotion for him and are always absorbed in him. Here, Sri Krishna is not speaking of jnanis who are impersonalists devoid of bhakti. To clarify this, he later says in Gita 7.19, After many births, the jnani, who is endowed with knowledge that everything, both conscious and inert, is related to Vasudeva, fully takes shelter of me. Such a great soul is extremely rare. The word jnani refers to knowledge that is not predominated by bhakti, whereas knowledge that is inclined towards Prema Bhakti is known as Jnana Mishra Bhakti. When one has made some progress in his sadhana and gives up Jnana due to an abundance of divine love, pure exclusive devotion or Prema Bhakti manifests in his heart. At the end of the sixth chapter, Bhagavan highly praises the yogis by stating that they are even superior to karmis, those who perform the prescribed duty, tapasvis, performers of austerity, and jnanis, those in search of knowledge. He instructs Arjuna to become a yogi, 6.46. But in Gita 6.47, Bhagavan defines what kind of yogi. Among all kinds of yogis, the best are those who always faithfully perform bhajan of me with their hearts. The word me in this verse refers to Sri Krishna himself. Therefore, when the Gita speaks of the yogi, it refers to the yogi who worships Sri Krishna in every way. In the Gita, yoga does not refer to Patanjal yoga, nor does it refer to the activities of karmis, yogis, or performers of dry austerities who are devoid of bhakti. Bhakti After bestowing vision of his universal form upon his devotee Arjuna, Sri Krishna tells him, Bhaktya dva ananyaya Sakya aham evam vidhu arjuna. Vision of this form of mine is only possible through exclusive devotion. You are my exclusive Brahmi Bhakta, and therefore you have seen it. 
GITA 11.54. Furthermore, in GITA 18.55 he says, Bhaktiamam Abhijananti. Only through pure devotion can someone see me, or know me in truth, and attain loving service to me in my abode. At the end of the Gita, after giving instructions on the confidential knowledge of the featureless aspect of Godhead, Brahma Jnana, the more confidential Paramatma Jnana or Ishvara Jnana, knowledge of the localized aspect of the Supreme Lord, Paramatma, and finally the most confidential Bhagavad Jnana, knowledge of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna says, Sarva Dharmam Parityajya Mam Ekam Sharanam Vraja. Abandon all varieties of religion and surrender exclusively to me. Gita 18.66. In this verse, Sri Krishna instructs Arjuna to surrender to him, giving up all worldly religion. By this, he establishes that bhakti is the only means to attain his complete form. Such bhakti is of two types, exclusive, kevala, and mixed with another process, predominating over it, pradani bhuta. Exclusive devotion, kevala bhakti, is devoid of the slightest scant of reward-seeking action, karma, empiric knowledge, jnana, and so forth, and is completely independent. Devotion that is mixed with another process and predominating over it, Pradhani Bhuta Bhakti, is of three kinds. Karma Pradhani Bhuta, in which devotion predominates over one's prescribed duty. Jnana Pradhani Bhuta, in which devotion predominates over knowledge, and karma jnana pradhani bhuta, in which devotion predominates over a mixture of prescribed duties and knowledge, when karma and jnana are devoid of the inclination to perform bhakti. They are simply called karma and jnana, respectively. Although in some places, the Gita gives instructions on devotion that predominates over another process. Those same places also certainly indicate exclusive devotion. To know Bhagavan through Pradhani Bhuta Bhakti or to attain him by it is very difficult. Therefore, in the Gita 8.14, Sri Krishna clearly states that he is easily attained through exclusive devotion, Ananya Bhakti or Kebala Bhakti. I am easily attained by those eternal yogis who being endowed with exclusive devotion always remember me and worship me. Furthermore, in Gita 9.22, Sri Krishna also states how he is controlled by the exclusive loving service of his devotees who are endowed with Ananya Bhakti. I, myself, provide and maintain the needs of devotees who exclusively worship me and who are always engaged in Bhakti. In various places throughout the Gita, Bhagavan Sri Krishna states, that he can be attained only through exclusive devotion. Gita 8.22, Gita 9.13, Gita 11.54, and finally, Sarva Dharma Parityajya Mam Ekam Shadanam Vraja Aham Tvam Sarva Pape Pyo Mokshaye Syami Ma Suchaha. Gita 18.66. It is thus verified that Vishuddha Bhakti, Ananya Bhakti or Kevala Bhakti is the ultimate goal of the living entities. How 
Should one practice this Ananya Bhakti, Sri Krishna instructs Arjuna as follows. Satatam kirtayantumam yatantascha tritha vrataha namasyantascha mam bhagya nitya yukta upasate. Constantly chanting the glories of my names, qualities, form and pastimes, endeavoring with determined vows and offering obeisances with devotion, they engage in my worship, remaining always connected with me. Gita 9.14 By this verse, Sri Krishna teaches that Sankirtan is the best method to worship him. Here, Sankirtan means the loud singing of Bhagavan's names, form, qualities and pastimes. It also alludes to the other limbs of Bhakti. Many insolently try to understand the Gita with their material knowledge and they also instruct others in this way. They do not know, however, that the Gita is transcendental, beyond mundane knowledge, logic and intellect. It is beyond the reach of pride valor, heroism, and erudition. It can be understood only by the mercy of Bhagavan and bestowed upon one who is surrendered. Therefore, the Shrutis state, Nayam Atma Pravajanena Labyo, the Supreme Lord is not obtained by expert explanations, by vast intelligence, or even by much hearing. He is obtained only by one to whom he himself gives mercy. Mundaka Upanishad 2.3.3 And Tesham Satata Yuktanam Dadami Buddhi Yogam Upon those who lovingly perform bhajan of me and yearn for my eternal association, I bestow that transcendental knowledge by which they attain me. Gita 10.10 In order to ascertain the meaning of a book, it is necessary to consider six things. First, its opening statements, Upakrama. Second, its closing statements, Upasamhara. Third, its repetition of a subject, Abhyasa. Fourth, the extraordinary result of reading it, Apurvata Pala. Fifth, its praise of a subject, Artavada. And sixth, its logical arguments that establish a conclusion, Upapati. Unless one considers all six elements, a book's true import remains elusive. Those who deliberate on the Gita, keeping this six limbs of analysis in the mind, will easily understand that prestili, pure devotion, is its final import. At present, however, ordinary people make conclusions on the meaning of the scriptures according to their own whims to fulfill selfish desires. They do not deliberate on these six limbs of analysis and therefore remain incapable of grasping the author's real intent. Nowadays, there is a trend for writers and speakers to make a comparative analysis in the areas of acquired knowledge, the application of that knowledge, science, politics and so on, but all hesitate to compare various religions. They conclude that such a study, which marks one religion as superior and another as inferior, would lead to tension or dispute between communities, throwing society into unrest. Moreover, social and global development would be obstructed. They conclude that to successfully engender harmony, it is essential to establish equality and friendship 
between all people, rather than to discuss religious distinctions, and that only when all religions are harmonized is it possible to establish peace and mutual friendship among all. In the field of politics, the comparative study of the differences in doctrine between heads of state is the only reason for inauspiciousness for a country and society. These people think that a comparative study of religion would similarly lead to communal dispute. Our comments on this is as follows. Just as a comparative study of knowledge and religion is necessary, so is a study of true harmony. What does this mean? Say, we place on both sides of a scale virtue and evil, sentience and insentience, diamond and coal, a thief and a saint, and justice and injustice, and then conclude that they are equal. Where is the deliberation? To declare equality in such cases is nothing less than ignorance and is incapable of causing real harmony. The word samanvaya, harmony, is derived from samyag, complete, and anvyaya, sequence. In other words, anvyaya, the syntax of a sentence, especially in terms of grammar, is known as samanvaya. If a sentence is to have samanvaya, proper harmony, then the subject, object and verb must be properly placed. The syntax will not be proper if we put the verb in a place of the subject, the object in the place of the verb and any other component of the sentence in place of the object. Consequently, if there is no anyaya, analysis or syntax, how will there be any samanvaya, harmony? Proper harmony or order leads to coherence, unity and the absence of impediments. Consequently, artificially making everything equal without considering virtue and fault or qualification and disqualification cannot be called harmony. It is not true harmony to try to please everybody in every way by saying that all are equal. To try to please everybody means to please nobody. At present, certain persons who adhere to so-called doctrine of harmonization claim that fruitive action, karma, knowledge, jnana, mysticism, yoga and devotion, bhakti, which are all taught in the Gita, are the same. But therein Bhagavan distinctly establishes the superiority of jnana over karma, yoga over jnana and bhakti over yoga. For living entities deluded by the external energy, the performance of one's prescribed duty with a desire for the fruit, sakama karma, is described as the best. For those who are more developed, the selfless performance of one's prescribed duty in which the fruit of that duty is offered to the Supreme Lord, Nishkama Bhagavat Arpita Karma, is said to be the best. For sadhakas, who are even more developed, knowledge of the truth is described as superior. And ultimately, pure devotion, Shuddha Bhakti, is described as most excellent of all. Sri Krishna himself 
establishes bhakti as the final subject expounded by the Gita. To know this is to properly understand the Gita. It is foolish to depend on one's limited intelligence to seek a harmony in the Gita that is different from the scientific comparative one spoken by Bhagavan. In regards to ascertain the absolute truth, Bhagavan Sri Krishna describes knowledge of his impersonal feature, Brahma Gyan, as confidential. Knowledge of his localized expansion, Paramatma Gyana, as more confidential, and transcendental devotion to him, Para Bhakti, as most confidential. This is the true Samanvaya of Gita. Some modern commentators consider worship of various demigods and goddesses to be equal to the worship of Bhagavan. However, the verse Ye Pi Anya Devata, Gita 9.23, states that worship of various demigods is unauthorized. Those who worship the demigods attain the planets of the demigods, and after enjoying there, they again return to this world. But those who worship Bhagavan attain loving service to him in his abode. They never fall from there. This is certainly mentioned in the Vedic scriptures. Yastu Narayanam Devam Brahma Rutradi Devataihi Vishnu Sarvishvareshe Tat itara samatir yasyava naraki saha. Those who consider Sri Narayana and the demigods headed by Rudra to be equal are atheists and go to hell. Some people incorrectly interpret this verse. Ye yata mam prapatyante tams tateva bajami aham. In whichever way a person serves me, I in turn serve him in that very same way. Everyone follows my path in all respects. Gita 4.11 They quote this to prove that all people ultimately attain the same abode, regardless of their type of worship. There are many paths but their destinations are one. But if we carefully deliberate on this verse, we see that this is not what it actually means. Bhagavan is actually saying that he rewards a person according to his surrender to him. In accordance with his acts, I shall reward him. How then is it possible for everyone be the same. The Gita does not state in this or any other verse that one who is surrendered achieves the same result as one who is not. Furthermore, the aim of those who take shelter of Bhagavan is not the same. The fruitive worker takes shelter of him with a desire to enjoy the empiric philosopher with a desire for liberation, the mystic with a desire to attain mystic perfections, and devotees with a desire to achieve exclusive loving service to him. Their desires, practices and aims are all different. Therefore, it is not possible that they will achieve the same result. Most people read this verse's second line. Mama Vartmanu Vartante Manushyaha Parta Sarvashyaha and wrongly conjecture that all people are progressing in all ways on the path to Bhagavan. By such thinking, they must also conclude that 
thieves, decoys, ruffians and adulterers are all progressing on the same path. But is this correct? No, never. The true meaning of this verse is that karma, jnana, yoga and bhakti are all paths delineated by Bhagavan. People receive a result appropriate to the path they follow in accordance with their qualification. One must accept that different paths lead to different results. There is a clear distinction between the thoughts and practices of Buddhists, Mayavadis, Jains, Shaivites, Shaktas and Vaishnavas. It is illogical to say that they all attain the same result and destination, for they all resort to different practices to fulfill their different desires. Shunyavadi Buddhists desire to merge into Nirvana, the void. Advaitavadis aspire for Brahma Sayujya, merging into the effulgence of the Supreme and shaktas desire material enjoyment. Shaivits chant Soham, I am him, or Shivoham, I am Shiva, to attain liberation. Buddhists do not accept the Vedas, whereas Advaitavadis do, and consider them to be of supramundane origin, Apaurusheya, shaktas, Consider Mahamaya to be the primeval potency, Adya Shakti, whereas Shaivats hold that it is Umapati Shiva who is the Parvatattva, supreme absolute truth. Their conceptions, practices, aims and objects of worship vary. So is it anything but sheer foolishness to say that they all attain the same result? The Gita certainly does not approve of such an opinion.